Finish it off. Evidently I was shell drunk too. Our guns continued to pump shells into the enemy ship, my third blunder. Actually, there were no shells coming from the dying San Francisco. A shrieking voice came through the deafening roar of guns. Warrant officer Shigeru Iwata was shouting at me from his observation post just above the bridge. Commander, another cruiser is sniping at us from 70 degrees to port. My head snapped to that direction, and there was another enemy cruiser. I stood frozen from head to toe, but finally yelled, Douse searchlight, stop shelling, spread smokescreen. I had not finished the order when the third salvo from the new enemy, later identified as Helena, reached Amatsukaze. Two shells landed very near. I hunched my back and clung to the railing. The blast was so strong it almost threw me off the bridge. The detonations were deafening. I got sluggishly to my feet, but my mind was a complete blank for several seconds. Next, I felt over my body, but found no wounds. Looking around, I saw with relief that all my nearby fellow officers were alive. What about others? I saw Iwata prostrate, hanging over the range, finding gear. Iwata! Iwata! I cried. What's the matter with you? He did not move. Blood covered his head. A piece of shrapnel had pierced his skull, killing him instantly. A shell had exploded at the fire director's station immediately above Iwata's observation post. Shimizu! Shimizu! I called at his voice tube. How are you? No reply came through. Radio men, report! I shouted into another tube. This tube was also dead silent. A second shell had pierced the deck slightly below the bridge and exploded in the radio room, killing everyone in it. The ship was still turning sharply to the right and was now starting into a loop. Matsumoto, turn the helm! I shouted. I did turn, sir, but there is no response. Flames rose from under the bridge, apparently from the radio room. More fires flared. Helena had really done a job on us. Damn it, let's return fire. A gunner struggled to the bridge, blood dripping from a shoulder wound. Sir, the turrets won't move. The hydraulic system has failed. An orderly came from the engine room, shouting, The rudder mechanism no longer works, sir. The hydraulics have failed. I talked to both men at once. What happened to Shimizu? How's the engine? Any fuel fires? Lieutenant Shimizu was blasted from the ship, sir leaving behind only one of his legs. The engine works unimpaired, sir. The fuel has not caught fire. All right, you gunner, go get first aid. Matsumoto, go to the engine room and check. Send reports to me every three minutes. The ship had come full circle on the ocean and was about to begin a second loop. Helena's shells were still raining around, but very few were now hitting. Near misses shook the ship violently. More fires were starting, but crewmen were active with water hoses. Our guns were still silent and we had no torpedoes. If the enemy closed, we would be as defenceless as a bull in a slaughterhouse. Amatsukaze's movements were getting more erratic, and she started her second circle in dense smoke. The rain of shells diminished as the enemy ship at last began to move away. Good, he was not going to finish the job. An orderly came with Matsumoto's message. The hydraulic system is definitely out. We'll have to operate the rudder with manpower, please confirm. All right, tell him to halt the ship for the shift to manpower operation right away. Miyoshi winced and said, Are we going to stop right here, sir? So near the enemy, certainly, before we encounter more enemy ships. One of the voice pipes squawked. It was Matsumoto reporting. Commander, we have patched some of the damage. Good, Matsumoto, stop the ship and shift the rudder for manpower operation. As the ship slowly shuddered to a halt, the enemy shelling stopped completely. Apparently the enemy ship had turned around thinking that Amatsukaze was done for. Through the dense smoke I could no longer see the enemy ship. Actually, Helena was having its own troubles, more serious than mine. As it had caught me unaware, so it was caught unaware by three freshly arrived Japanese destroyers. The trio Asagumo, Murasame and Samidare originally had been in the vanguard arc formation with Yudachi and Harusame. Because of the drastic pre-battle manoeuvres, they had fallen to the rear just before the battle started. They finally came on the scene barely in time to catch Helena. The enemy cruiser was battered helpless by three ships emerging from nowhere. Before it could determine who and where the new opponents were, Helena was defeated. Murasame's torpedoes delivered fatal blows, but the cruiser miraculously drifted a few more hours before sinking. Asagumo, Murasame's teammate, 
turned its guns toward another enemy ship approaching from the east. Destroyer Monsen, her identification lamps lit, approached naively in the belief that the three prowling ships were friendly. Her lamps were suicidal, just as my searchlight had been when it attracted Helena. Several rapid salvos disabled Monsen, and Asagumo finished her with torpedoes. Monsen had been followed closely by Fletcher, who, in no mood to challenge the Japanese trio, turned tail and cleared out. Sterrett, one of the surviving enemy destroyers, claimed the sinking of a Japanese destroyer at this time and location with two torpedo hits. But there was no such Japanese destroyer. Akatsuki had sunk some time earlier, and Yudachi was still burning several miles to the west. It appears evident that Sterrett must have mistakenly sunk an American vessel. Her victim must have been one that was still barely adrift after absorbing a surfeit of Japanese torpedoes and shells. Some American versions say that Japanese guns fired on Japanese ships near the end of this battle. After checking with all my friends who took part in the battle, and after examining damage to the surviving Japanese destroyers, I can definitely state that this contention is unfounded. On the other hand, many of my friends say that the American ships exchanged gunfire among themselves in this battle. After Amatsukaze's helm and rudder were disengaged from the shattered hydraulic system, we resumed navigation. Luckily, the engines were in good order, and we quickly picked up a 20-knot speed. It is always difficult to handle the rudder of a 2,500-ton ship manually, and Amatsukaze had been badly battered. Her gears were twisted and there were many gaping holes in the hull. The ship moved like a drunken man, skidding wildly from side to side. After a few painful minutes of watching this erratic movement, I knew what had to be done, and spoke into the tube. Matsumoto, I'll take over. This manpower operation requires experience. Your timing is off. From now on I'll give steering orders from up here, and you pass them to your boys. Ten husky men dripped sweat handling the rudder. It was a back-breaking task. But my chore wasn't easy. I had to keep shouting almost steadily. My voice croaked and sweat streamed down my face. The veering movement continued, but the steering was less erratic. At 3am, Miyoshi reported that all fires were under control. A few minutes later I saw Hie to port. Her fires appeared to have subsided, but the flagship was almost at a standstill. There were no Japanese ships around to offer help. I felt sorry for my friends in the doomed ship, but my ship was in no shape to help anyone. The most I could do was to keep her going in a northerly direction. It was barely possible for us to negotiate the narrow waters of indispensable strait. Mustering all my strength and determination, I kept shouting directions into the voice tube, and we kept moving. At the first sign of daylight, Ensen Shoji shouted, Three enemy planes approach. I ordered Miyoshi, take command of the guns, do your best. The torpedo officer darted from the bridge. An orderly reported shortly, no guns rotate and only number one gun can be elevated skyward. That lone gun fired rapidly as the planes came close. They overestimated our speed and released their bombs too early. The nearest one fell some 300 metres off our bows. After one pass, the planes turned back toward Guadalcanal. More planes would probably follow, but brooding was of no use. We had work to do, just keeping the ship moving forward, and we kept at it. Our luck seemed about to run out when Shoji next reported, Commander, a ship sighted 9,000 metres ahead, speeding straight for us. What should we do, sir? Instead of replying, I yelled into the pipe again, Matsumoto, an undetermined ship is sighted ahead. Make your maximum speed. We can do nothing but ram if it is the enemy. Shoji dashed out to prepare the crew for this drastic action. I glanced again at the ship. It was closing on us at a speed of well over 30 knots. After a tense minute, I breathed a deep sigh of relief and called my orderly to summon Shoji quickly. It's a Japanese destroyer, yes, Yukikaze, unmistakably. Shoji came back leaping and bouncing with joy and relief. From a distance of 3,000 metres, a Yukikaze signalman started waving flags. They were distinct in the morning light, Heartiest congratulations to Amatsukaze. We're heading to assist Hiei. Anything we can do for you? My signalman immediately relayed my answer. Thanks for your greetings. Don't bother about us. Go ahead full speed. Enemy planes already spotted us. Very probably Hiei too. Be prepared for air attack. Good luck. 
We passed Yukikaze on our port beam at a distance of thousand metres. Crews on deck exchanged greetings. Though they had travelled a long way together in the meantime, this was the first time the two ships had seen each other since early the previous day. Yukikaze had been stationed immediately ahead of Amatsukaze in Abe's complex formation. We had not been visible to each other for the many hours of our blind march. In the battle, Yukikaze and cruiser Nagara were among the first to withdraw from the area. Yukikaze had not received a single hit. My warning to Yukikaze proved right. Scores of marine bombers swarmed over Hiei and demolished her. Admiral Abe ordered Hiei scuttled before abandoning ship as Yukikaze came alongside. It was this scuttling order which cost the jobs of Abe and Captain Masao Nishida, Hiei's skipper, a few days later. After passing Yukikaze, my ship slowed to its previous twenty knots. We were out of the hazardous strait and in a wide area. Our worries about shoals and reefs were over, but new worries cropped up. Daylight was unwelcomed to a lone crippled ship in an area infested by enemy submarines. The sonar equipment in Japanese destroyers, as explained earlier, was not of a high standard. Even when in working order, it was useless when a ship was running at twenty knots or better. Amatsukaze's sonar was completely dead at this time. Matsumoto, you had better change your rudder detail every hour. We'll need real muscular strength to make any abrupt turns. Submarines may set on us at any moment. Strangely enough, for the next twelve hours there were no attacks. Enemy submarines must have seen Amatsukaze. Perhaps there was no attack because they did not realise that the lone wolf was limping. Amatsukaze was running at a steady twenty knots. Its skidding to left and right must have seemed like an intentional zigzag pattern. Had they come close, they would have seen how beaten up and crippled we were. About 3pm another Japanese destroyer loomed on the horizon. Knowing we had reached safety, I suddenly felt exhausted. Accurate navigation had brought us to a spot about 250 miles north of Guadalcanal, where Vice Admiral Takeo Kurita's fleet was standing by to sortie that night. As we closed in, I found destroyer Terutsuki, another companion of the Abe fleet. My signalman sent a message inquiring as to the general situation. A reply came quickly. Welcome home, Amatsukaze. Our heartiest congratulations. You were reported lost hours ago. Few of us expected your return. Our fleet did well. Only Hiei and Yudachi were reported dead in the water. Akatsuki has not been heard from and is considered lost. Murasame and Ikazuchi received shell hits, none vital. Again, congratulations. You worked a wonder. We are proud of you. As we approached Terutsuki, again most all of her crew moved to the railings and waved at us, calling Ataboy Amatsukaze. Several other ships repeated the same kind of welcome for us, but I felt no triumph at all. My heart was heavy with remorse at my blunders. Amatsukaze was already inside the formation of Kurita's ships and was slowing down. His flagship, 27,500-ton battleship Congo, emerged like a fortress. Her signalman was sending a flag message to us, from Admiral Kurita to Commander Hara. I salute your brave return, and am pleased to inform you I have orders for you to go along in my sortie. I shall be proud to have you with us. Acknowledge. I was astounded at this message and replied promptly, from Commander Hara to Admiral Kurita. Your compliments unwarranted. I return a cripple with loss of 43 crewmen, including gunnery officer. We are in need of repair. We are on manual steering now. A few minutes later, Congo's message came. Admiral Kurita orders you to return to Truk immediately. We repeat our respects to you all the same. Bon voyage and good luck. See you again. Congo blurred through my tears as I read this warm message. I was choked up but managed to rasp into the voice tube. Matsumoto turned to starboard. We are going home. Yes, sir, Matsumoto replied. Say, Commander, you sound tired. Why don't you rest? You have been shouting continuously for the past fifteen hours. I have learned enough of the rhythm and timing from your rudder directions to handle it now. Thank you, Matsumoto. I guess you are right. You take over. I sat down for the first time in more than 24 hours. Minutes later I sprang from the chair. I had forgotten something. Miyoshi Shoji. We must conduct funeral services before dark. Forty-three bodies, some mere token remains, were brought to the foredeck. Close friends of each of the deceased came forward, cleansed the bodies with hot fresh water and wrapped them in canvas. 
precious distilled water was used freely for this ceremony. The wrapped and weighted bodies were dropped into the sea, while buglers sounded a farewell and the crew saluted. A sea burial is always sad. I had attended several such services, but never one so sad as this. When Miyoshi and Shoji consigned the first remains a leg of Lieutenant Kazue Shimizu, the gunnery officer to the sea, I wept. Shimizu, a headstrong man, had often argued with me, but he was a fine man and an excellent officer. If I had followed his recommendation and closed with Juno, perhaps I would not have committed the blunders which cost his life. Two petty officers stepped forward to take care of the body of Warrant Officer Iwata, the man who, by sighting Helena, had once saved the ship and crew. I walked down from the bridge. The crew stared. It was the first time I had left the bridge since the start of this operation. Iwata was my friend. I will take care of his remains. The two men gaped when I doffed my uniform jacket and put it over Iwata. Iwata, farewell, I murmured. Rest in peace. Tears flooded my eyes as I stood at attention and saluted. Trudging back to the bridge, I saw many crewmen weeping like children, several wiping their eyes with their fists. As I watched the setting of the big, fiery sun, I pledged never to repeat my mistakes. It was completely dark by the time the funeral services ended. Amatsukaze circled the burial area once while the crew offered prayers in a final farewell to their 43 buddies, and then continued to the north. Matsumoto, a young graduate of the Merchant Marine School, had learned the manual handling of the rudder very quickly. The ship advanced with a minimum of skidding, and 24 hours later, on November 14th, Amatsukaze anchored in Truk's quiet atoll. At Truk, I heard that Japanese submarine I-26 had just torpedoed and sunk a crippled United States cruiser near Guadalcanal. It was years later, however, that I learned that this was Cruiser Juno, which Amatsukaze had hit and disabled. The battle ended unquestionably in a Japanese victory, but the win was purely tactical. Strategically, the enemy had won because the Abe Force failed to deliver a single incendiary shell to Guadalcanal airfields. Nine American warships were sunk, but not in vain. They contributed greatly to the American side in the bitter contest for this island. Admiral Yamamoto at Truk was upset by the failure of Abe's mission. Hiei was the first Japanese battleship to be sunk in the war. Its scuttling infuriated Yamamoto, who had been quite lenient with earlier blunders committed by others of his men. The high command in Tokyo was also stung. The anger of the top admirals did not abate when they heard of Vice Admiral Nobutake Kondo's failure, immediately following that of Abe. A panel of admirals was established to conduct a secret court of inquiry. Abe and Captain Nishida, Hiei's skipper, were called to testify. They offered no defence of their actions or mistakes. The court's verdict was retirement for the two officers, almost the equivalent of the US Navy's dishonourable discharge. They were allowed pensions, but were barred from public office. On the night of November 13th, Rear Admiral Shoji Nishimura's squadron of three cruisers and four destroyers closed the coast of Guadalcanal and shelled the airfields. The shelling was so ineffective that marine planes rose from these airfields next morning. They teamed with carrier Enterprise planes and swooped on a Japanese convoy of 11 transports, sinking or disabling seven of them. The planes also sank cruiser Kinugasa and heavily damaged three destroyers. Admiral Kondo, Deputy Commander-in-Chief of the Combined Fleet, was ordered to replace Kurita as leader of the next sortie on the night of November 14th. Two 13,000-ton cruisers, Otago and Takao, under Kondo's direct command, were suddenly teamed with the original Abe fleet, Les Hie and three destroyers. Admiral Yamamoto's choice of Kondo proved to be a disastrous mistake. It is still a mystery to me why Yamamoto thought so highly of Kondo, even after his half-hearted actions in two earlier important battles. Kondo's three battleships, small cruiser and nine destroyers, encountered a clearly inferior American force of two battleships and four destroyers led by Rear Admiral Willis Augustus Lee. Despite his distinct numerical advantage, Kondo lost battleship Kirishima and a destroyer, while Lee lost only three destroyers. Kondo's two fast cruisers were still intact, but Kondo ordered their withdrawal without even trying to give chase to the American ships. It was his third such half-hearted effort in four months. 
Admiral Yamamoto, who was stern with Abe, was strangely lenient with Kondo. Many of Kondo's officers were ashamed of him and of themselves. They preferred not to talk about the battle. Kondo was the British gentleman sort of man. He was amiable and affable to everyone and was known as a scholar. He was always good to me and I had great respect for him. But I must say that it was one of Yamamoto's greatest errors that he so greatly overvalued Kondo's fighting ability. Kondo might have been a great commandant of the Naval Academy, but he was a misfit as commander of a naval fighting unit. At Truk, Amatsukaze went alongside repair ship Akashi, whose chief engineer promptly came on board to inspect our damage. I acknowledged that our ship had been banged up a bit, but pointed out that she had made it back to port under her own steam, and concluded with my hope that Amatsukaze could be patched up without delay, so that we might join the fleet again in a week or ten days. The engineer smiled patiently and said, Commander Hara, most skippers underestimate damage in their own ship, and, when engaged in battle, do things considered impossible in a normal voyage. Let's look around. I understand you fitted out this ship. Will you come along and explain her finer points? Amatsukaze was indeed my baby. As her fitting-out officer, I had been at her launching early in 1940 and had spent the next six months supervising her every need. She was the finest destroyer of her day, this 2,500-ton fighting ship, and I knew every inch of her. The engineer and I spent a day going over her injuries. By the end of the tour, my optimism had fallen flat on its face. In her hull, we counted 32 holes larger than one metre in diameter. In addition, there were five smaller holes which had been bored by dud shells. After 40 small shrapnel holes, I stopped counting. That American cruiser had done a real job, which I had estimated as only three hits. The engineer was right. No longer a prize destroyer, Amatsukaze was but a floating wreck. At the end of the tour, we came to my cabin, where I flopped into a chair, depressed and morose. The engineer said understandingly, let me congratulate you on magnificent seamanship in bringing your ship back at all, let alone in such good time. You have really worked a miracle, but it cannot be repeated. I recognised the truth of his words, but was so dispirited that I had nothing to say. He continued, As you must realise we cannot concentrate all our efforts on your Amatsukaze. There are others that need repairs too. I estimate that it will take a month to patch up your ship enough to get back to Japan. Their precision parts will be available, and it should be possible to have Amatsukaze fully seaworthy in one month. But, I stammered, there is evidence that the enemy can affect major repairs in much less than 60 days. Why can't we? I knew that the answer lay in the enemy's tremendous industrial capacity, so far superior to Japan's, and realised how embarrassing my question was. An awkward silence followed until I spoke again. Please do your best. I will stay with my ship. My men will cooperate with your repair crews in every possible way. The engineer expressed his appreciation, saluted and withdrew. I was left to brood, and again stroll the decks of my ship. Countless holes from machine gun bullets made me feel that we were lucky not to have lost more than 43 lives. Repairs were begun the following morning. For the next week I was busy showing off my miracle ship to visitors from battleship Yamato and other ships anchored in the harbour of Truk. Without exception they marvelled that Amatsukaze had survived. Many visitors congratulated me, but none asked my opinion of how to avoid such a fate in the future. I was more than ready with many recommendations, but no one asked. It puzzled me that not one of the staff officers from Combined Fleet who visited my battle-scarred ship was interested enough to ask me for opinions or recommendations. When this lack of curiosity continued throughout the week, I began to wonder about the ability of these men. It was disquieting to think that they, who were helping to form plans and strategy, were not interested in learning from recent battle experiences. Perhaps they were not as well qualified for their jobs as they should be. A most disturbing thought indeed. Two letters from Japan reached me at Truk, in a letter written on November 13th, my wife told of conditions at home and concluded, Little Mikito awakened suddenly last night and cried loud and long. I thought at first he was sick, but he finally explained that he had dreamed you were in danger. He said you looked pale and frightened. I wonder where you were last night and what you were doing. The newspapers tell of bitter battles in the South. I am worried about you. 
Noting the date, I recalled the night of November 12th to 13th and its dangers. I must have looked pale when we were being battered by the enemy cruiser, because I certainly was frightened. How could my little son have seen it? My mother, 82 years of age, had written the other letter. It concluded, I pray each morning and night at the family altar that our ancestors and the merciful Buddha will protect you. Take care of yourself and come back alive. My eyes filled with tears at reading this. My thoughts turned to the families of my dead crewmen, and I wept aloud. Letters of condolence must be written to those 43 families before I could reply to my wife and mother. The sun was setting when I finished this sad task eight hours later and walked out on deck. A motorboat approached Amatsukaze. Another curious spectator, but the courtesies must be observed. I approached the ramp as the boat came alongside. The passenger shouted a cheery greeting as he came up, and I recognised Commander Yasumi Toyama. He was Chief of Staff on Rear Admiral Razio Tanaka's Destroyer Squadron 2, based at Rabul. I had previously belonged to this squadron, and we were old friends. He was in truck for tactical conferences in Admiral Yamamoto's flagship Yamato. You look sick, he said. What is the matter? Were you hurt in battle? No, not a bit. I just feel let down. Anyone would after his ship had taken a beating like this. No, Hara, you should not feel bad. You did a terrific job. I had a good look at Amatsukaze from the motorboat. I knew you were the Navy's number one torpedo officer, but never realised what a navigator you are. Any other skipper would have lost this ship. I can't agree, Toyama. We were just lucky that those countless enemy shells missed the engine and fuel tanks. Tell me, how is the squadron? Ah, he groaned. We are more a freighter convoy than a fighting squadron these days. The damn Yankees have dubbed us the Tokyo Express. We transport cargo to that cursed island, and our orders are to flee rather than fight. What a stupid thing. It is doubtful whether we could fight anyway. Our decks are stacked so high with supplies for Guadalcanal that our ammunition supply must be cut in half. Our cargo is loaded in drums which are roped together. We approach near the island, throw them overboard and run away. The idea is that the strings of barrels will float until our troops on the island can tow them ashore. It is a strenuous and unsatisfying routine, but I want to hear about your battle and learn from your experience. Tell me all about it. That was the first intelligent request I had heard in a week. I explained with enthusiasm and in detail our latest operation, noting our failings and the enemies, and giving my fellow professional an overall analysis. In conclusion, I said... Whatever our mission, we must always be ready for battle. I think it is wrong ever to consider fighting as merely secondary. Caution is necessary to be sure, but excessive caution is crippling. Please tell Admiral Tanaka not to repeat our mistakes. He left the ship to catch a plane back to Rabul. His quick visit to Truk and his remarks about the curious supply activities of Destroyer Squadron 2 indicated that the enemy undoubtedly had air supremacy at Guadalcanal. Japanese destroyers were even having trouble acting as fast freighters. Supplies of every kind were acutely lacking for Japanese troops on the island. Their daily distress calls emphasised shortages of food and medication. Admiral Tanaka had been given responsibility for the stave-off starvation missions Toyama had described. In these operations, each destroyer would carry 100 or more drums of supplies in each nighttime delivery. Delivery consisted of jettisoning the strings of drums within 200 or 300 metres of the Guadalcanal coast. There, army troops were supposed to boat, swim or wade out to retrieve the precious containers and haul them ashore, where they would be manipulated into the jungle and hidden from enemy air attack. Tanaka's eight destroyers left Rabaul November 27th and headed southward to the shortlands. The passage had to be made furtively. In the darkness of the 29th, the squadron departed the shortlands at 10.45 for the final leg of the mission. Taking every possible advantage, the force fainted eastward toward Roncador Reef and Ramos Island. Then, early in the morning of November 30th, the eight destroyers, in single column, turned sharply south and headed straight for Guadalcanal. An enemy patrol plane made contact with the squadron at 8am, and Admiral Tanaka realised that his secrecy of movement was broken. Soon afterward, an observation post on Guadalcanal reported a dozen enemy destroyers off Lunga Point. Messages from other posts soon confirmed this movement of an enemy surface force around the island. 
At 3pm, Tanaka issued a directive to his squadron. It is probable that we will encounter an enemy force tonight. Although our primary mission is to land supplies, everyone is to be ready for combat. If an engagement occurs, take the initiative and destroy the enemy. The squadron reached the rendezvous point off Tassafaronga at 9pm, and speed was slowed to 12 knots. A northeasterly breeze yielded a visibility of 9,000 metres. Tanaka's ships approached in single column formation with Takanami as scout, 3,000 metres in the lead and slightly on the port bow of flagship Naganami. This was a flexible deployment for destroyers and far more advantageous than the overcautious double ring formation used by Admiral Abe on the night of November 12th to 13. The American force, which came to challenge Tanaka under Rear Admiral Carlton H. Wright, repeated the formation used by Callahan and Scott. They too were in single column, four destroyers in the van, five cruisers, then two rear destroyers, the whole led by destroyer Fletcher with its modern radar equipment. Two weeks earlier, Fletcher had survived the Callahan-Scott debacle from its position at the tail of the formation. When the action opened, the US side had a distinct advantage of numbers. Besides numerical inferiority, Tanaka was further handicapped in that the decks of his ships were stacked high with drums of supplies. Because of these cargoes, the ammunition supply in each ship had to be reduced by one half. In addition to the reduction of shells for their guns, each of Tanaka's destroyers carried only eight torpedoes instead of their full quota of 16. Admiral Wright's squadron had left Espiritu Santo early in the morning, specifically to intercept Tanaka's destroyers, which had been spotted by scout plane. At 9.6pm, flagship Minneapolis's radar first detected the Japanese force at 26,000 yards. Ten minutes later, radar screens in Fletcher caught a target 7,000 yards on the port bow, and the destroyer prepared to launch torpedoes. But five precious minutes were wasted before Fletcher, as well as destroyers Perkins and Drayton, were given permission to fire torpedoes. A total of 20 fish sped toward Japanese targets. None hit. Meanwhile, Admiral Tanaka was busy studying charts and the position of his ships. His cargo dumping point was only 5,000 metres distant at 9.15pm when scout ship Takanami reported. Enemy ships bearing 100 degrees, identified as three destroyers. Takanami immediately launched eight torpedoes at these targets and opened fire with her guns. This was done on Takanami's own initiative, without waiting for permission to open fire. Until the five US cruisers opened fire at this time, Tanaka had been unaware of their presence. Instantly, Tanaka ordered, Belay supply schedule, all ships prepare to fight. One minute later, at 9.22, Tanaka further ordered, All ships, full battle speed. American gunners seemed to have aimed at only Takanami. She, at any rate, was the only Japanese ship hit. Many direct hits set her furiously afire, and she sank with all of her 211 crewmen. With flaming Takanami as a shield, Tanaka made a daring 180-degree turn to bring his ships on a course parallel to the enemy column. He then speeded up to close with the enemy ships, and Naganami swung to port after firing a spread of eight torpedoes at leading cruiser Minneapolis. The six other Japanese destroyers promptly followed Naganami's example. These broadside launchings had far more precision than those of Fletcher and her companions who fired at targets approaching head-on. It was no wonder or surprise that the American torpedoes missed. They had been fired at an almost impossible angle, apparently without proper calculation of the many factors involved. The consequent poor marksmanship reflected a lack of training in torpedo technique. Two of Naganami's torpedoes, on the other hand, hit Minneapolis, shattering her bow, exploding a fire room, and slowing the lead cruiser almost to a stop. New Orleans, next in line, narrowly avoided colliding with the flagship when a torpedo, apparently from Makinami, caught her port bow and exploded two forward magazines. The blast knocked off the cruiser's bow clear back to the number two turret. Cruiser Pensacola, next in line, also fared badly. While trying desperately to avoid a collision, she took a torpedo hit which ignited fuel tanks, turning her into a floating torch. It was twelve hours before the flames were conquered, and the crew knew that they could save her. Light cruiser Honolulu followed Pensacola until that ship turned to port when the torpedoes began hitting. 
At that time, Honolulu swerved to starboard to avert colliding and thus got out of the glare shed by her burning colleagues. She zigzagged away to the northwest and escaped being hit even by gunfire. Northampton, the last cruiser of the enemy formation, could have seen little of the activity until she was upon her three flaming colleagues. She started to follow Honolulu, but seeing the Japanese ships dashing to the west, turned westward herself and opened fire with eight-inch guns. Hers was a hasty, blind shelling which scored no hits, but two Japanese torpedoes caught her port side, causing a monstrous explosion which swept her with flames and left Northampton to sink. Tanaka's squadron swung northwest at full speed as soon as its torpedoes were launched, leaving behind a badly battered and confused enemy. Honolulu, the only undamaged cruiser of the American force, mistook rearguard destroyers Lamson and Lardner for Japanese targets and blazed away at them until they turned and fled. The action had lasted about 15 minutes. Flagship Naganami slowed down some 50 miles away from Guadalcanal, and Admiral Tanaka took account of his forces. Not one of his surviving seven destroyers had been hit by a single shell or torpedo, nor had they lost a man of their crews. It was a remarkable performance to have inflicted so much damage on the enemy at a cost of only one destroyer. But Admiral Tanaka was not jubilant. He grieved over the loss of Takanami and was glumly silent during the withdrawal, while he considered returning to the battle zone to rescue survivors and re-engage the enemy. A tally showed that four of his seven ships had spent all their torpedoes, one had fired only half of its supply, and the two others had fired none because of a bad angle during their firing ran. A total of 44 torpedoes had thus been expended. In light of this, Tanaka decided that his force was no longer in shape to engage the enemy. Accordingly, at 11.30pm, he gave the order to return to Rabaul. The high command took a dim view of this decision, even though Tanaka claimed to have sunk a battleship and two cruisers, and to have damaged four other cruisers. The facts were impressive enough, for Tanaka had sunk one and seriously damaged three heavy cruisers, at a cost of only one destroyer. But these statistics were not as persuasive with Tanaka's superiors as the fact that he had failed to unload the cargo so badly needed on Guadalcanal. The Navy's displeasure with Tanaka was reflected in his transfer to Singapore shortly after this battle and then to Burma. These transfers, which took him away from the active fighting front, where his ability was so desperately needed, undoubtedly saved his life. Who knows what the Navy's short-sighted retributive policy may have cost in subsequent losses, which Tanaka might have prevented. Throughout the war, Tanaka never again held a responsible command afloat. Fifteen years after the Battle of Tassafaronga, I visited him at his farm near Yamaguchi. In discussing the action, he told me, I have heard that US naval experts praised my command in that action. I am not deserving of such honours. It was the superb proficiency and devotion of the men who served me that produced the tactical victory for us. In this I am not rejecting glory in order to escape criticism. I accept the principal criticism levelled by fellow officers. It was an error on my part not to deliver the supplies according to schedule. I should have returned to do so. The delivery mission was abandoned simply because we did not have accurate information about the strength of the enemy force. I believed that the enemy formation had four van destroyers and four more following the cruisers, as in the Callaghan-Scott formation of two weeks earlier. I saw no percentage in having our seven destroyers, low on ammunition and decks loaded with cargo drums, fight another running battle against eight US destroyers. Had I but known that only one cruiser and four destroyers remained in fighting trim. Tears came to his eyes when he spoke of destroyer Takanami, we were able to defeat Admiral Wright's ships in this action only because of Takanami. She absorbed all the punishment of the enemy in the opening moments of battle, and she shielded the rest of us. Yet we left the scene without doing anything for her or her valiant crew. However, Admiral Tanaka may have felt about the Japanese effort at Tassafaronga, it is fair to consider what the US naval historian Rear Admiral Samuel Elliot Morrison had to say about this battle. It is always some consolation to reflect that the enemy who defeats you is really good, and Rear Admiral Tanaka was better than that he was superb. Without his trusted flagship Jinsu, his decks cluttered with supplies, he sank a heavy cruiser and put three others out of action for nearly a year, 
at the cost of one destroyer. In many actions of the war, mistakes on the American side were cancelled by those of the enemy, but despite the brief confusion of his destroyers, Tanaka made no mistakes at Tassafaronga. My promotion to captain came on the first day of May 1943. Shigure's skipper, Lieutenant Commander Kimio Yamagami, gave a party in my honour. The officers crowded the gunroom to congratulate me and toast me with sake. After a couple of drinks, Yamagami said hesitatingly, The crew has been working hard for the past 40 days without any real relaxation. I see that factory ship Akashi is showing a movie tonight. Do you think I might allow the men to go see it? It pained me to refuse this reasonable request, but I explained, I know we are on a rough schedule seven days a week, but it is necessary. Do not think me harsh, but we cannot afford to let up one bit at this critical time. That silenced Yamagami, a very mild man. But Lieutenant Toshio Doi, the torpedo officer, spoke up. Captain Hara, forgive my bluntness, but I don't understand why the men can't have some respite. They'd be invigorated by a little recreation and they certainly deserve it. Doi, I answered, this may also seem blunt, but our crew has never been in battle where the slightest mistake may mean death for ship and shipmates as well as oneself. They may curse me now and think me harsh for imposing this rigorous training. But I want you, their officers, to understand that I insist on this regimen, because it is better for them to suffer here in training than to be killed by the enemy. The brief, clumsy silence that followed was broken by Lieutenant Hiroshi Kayanama, the chief engineer. Gentlemen, I share Captain Hara's feelings. In recent months, many of our destroyers have been sunk, and Captain Hara has seen it happen. We are lucky to have a division commander of his experience. Let us set a proper example. Quit beefing and take advantage of his skill and experience. Those of us who do not know enough to appreciate him now will find out before long how grateful they should be to Captain Hara Yamagami, proposed a final toast to me, in which all the officers joined. The party broke up and we all went to night combat stations. Walking back to the bridge, I said to Yamagami, I feel sorry for you, Skipper, having to put up with a son of a bitch like me who dictates so concerning your crew. Normally a division commander leaves the running of a ship to her captain. I cannot explain further why I am compelled to take charge in Shigure, but I do appreciate your co-cooperativeness and hope that you will someday understand. Yamagami nodded meekly. Had he been forceful or obdurate as Shigure's skipper, he could have made my task most unpleasant. Fortunately for me, he was most cooperative and obliging. After six weeks of training, Shigure was assigned to guard duties at Truk. This involved escorting transport ships in and out of the harbour, and also being on the lookout for enemy submarines. These light duties did not interrupt my training programme in any way. Meanwhile, the overall war situation was not improving for Japan. After withdrawing from Guadalcanal, Japanese forces fell back to dig in on other islands up the Solomon's chain. But the enemy's offensive capability seemed to be growing far faster than Japan's defensive capability. Admiral Minichi Koga, who succeeded Admiral Yamamoto as Commander-in-Chief Combined Fleet, continued the tactics of his predecessor. Destroyers and light cruisers were committed piecemeal into battle. These expendable elements, working desperately day and night, scored occasional local victories, but failed to change the tide of the war. With the retreat from Guadalcanal, Japan's most forward defence line in the Solomons lay in the New Georgia Group. There were bases at Munda on the main island and at nearby Kolombangara, with a total of about 10,500 troops in the area. It was here that the US Navy drove a wedge on June 30th, 1943, with landings on the northern tip of Rendover Island and at Vangunu Island. These landings posed a threat to the Japanese bases, and Admiral Koga ordered maximum reinforcements for the garrison troops. Our destroyers were again called into action on Tokyo Express assignments for this ferry service. Carrying tremendous loads of men and supplies, these ships fought fierce battles against better equipped and numerically superior enemy forces on the 4th, 6th, 12th and 19th of July. In spite of distinct disadvantages, these plucky little ships gave good accounts of themselves. Particularly brilliant were the exploits of five destroyers in Kula Gulf on the night of July 12th. Indeed, their success outshone the November battle off Guadalcanal in which I had taken part, 
and the famed Tanaka action of November 30th in the same vicinity. In the Kula Gulf battle, a Japanese force of light cruiser Jinsu and destroyers Yukikaze, my old teammate Hamakaze, Mikazuki, Ayanami and Yugure, took on an allied force consisting of two US and one New Zealand cruisers and ten destroyers. The engagement opened around midnight when Jinsu repeated battleship Hiei's blunder of using searchlights and was promptly sunk by concentrated gunfire. In the ensuing action cruiser, Leander was knocked out by torpedoes. The Allies made the mistake of dividing into two groups. One of these, consisting of four destroyers, failed to engage any Japanese ships. The five Japanese destroyers, storming back and forth, completely outmaneuvered the other group, knocking out cruisers St. Louis and Honolulu and sinking destroyer Gwyn. In the confusion destroyers, Woodworth and Buchanan collided, and the Japanese ships returned to base, damaged but triumphant. Yet the loss of that one cruiser was more costly to Japan than were the casualties Yukikaze and her colleagues inflicted on three cruisers and three destroyers of the Allies. At Truk, I heard of Yukikaze's exploits with some envy. She had not had great achievement in battle when teamed with my Amatsukaze in late 1942, but she was the only ship to survive the Bismarck Sea battle without a scratch. With her Kula Gulf exploit, she was becoming a ship of some note. I vowed to match her exploits with my Shigure when we were ordered to move to Rabul on July 20th. I was glad to get the orders. So far I had been a division commander in name only, since all my ships but Shigure were assigned to other commands. Two of my destroyers, Yuga and Ariake, were at Rabul. It was stimulating to think of having three of my ships together at one time. I knew that Yugura, having just come from earning glory with Yukikaze in the Kula Gulf battle, would be a great asset to the division. My feelings were shared by Shigure's entire crew, and their morale soared when they heard of Yugura's exploits. They were tired after almost four months of intensive training, but they rejoiced at the prospect of moving to the front and having the chance to engage in battle. Shigure headed south at a steady 18 knots, loaded to capacity with plane parts badly needed at Rabul. I thought of how the weeks of recent training had transformed Shigure's sloppy, dispirited crew into a snappy, hard-working team. I had been very sparing with praise during their training, but they had done a good job. Still, experience had taught me that one real action teaches more than a thousand manoeuvres. I would save my praise until they had withstood their baptism of fire and hope that the acid test would not find them wanting. I was eager for battle. Yukikaze had been successful, and if she could succeed, we could. The voyage to Rabul was eventless, and we arrived on July 23rd. I reported at once to the headquarters, where a staff officer silently handed me a report. I scanned it hastily and was stunned. Destroyers Yugur and Kiyonami had been sunk south of Choiseul on the 20th. They were part of a transport mission to Kolombangara, which had been thwarted a week earlier and were trying again. The entire crews had perished 228 in Yugur and 240 in Kiyonami. Thus, the enemy had avenged their losses at Kula Gulf within a week. As soon as Shigure's cargo was unloaded, I told the crew what had happened to the two destroyers. They listened in silence and, I gathered, began to feel that all their training had been worth the effort. Destroyer Division 27 was still my command in name only, but Ariake returned on the 21st with two other destroyers from a successful supply mission to Kolombangara. This trio had chosen Vela Gulf as their approach route instead of Kula Gulf. A powerful enemy force of four cruisers and three destroyers were on the prowl in Kula Gulf, but they did not find out until too late that the Japanese destroyers had entered and departed on the other side of the island. Rabul's supply base for all Japanese forces in both the Solomon Islands and the New Guinea theatres was a hectic place in the summer of 1943. Destroyer Shigure was allowed to rest, but checkups, familiarisation cruises and the like kept it from being a rest for just six days when orders arrived to join with three ships of Destroyer Division 4 on a transport mission to Kolombangara. We were to take the route through Vela Gulf that had been used so successfully by Ariake ten days earlier, because headquarters said this route was safe enough. I did not share this complacency, however, because of my observation that a repetition of the same operational formula usually ended disastrously. 
We should not expect that the enemy's cruisers and destroyers would again obligingly waste time and fuel in Kula Gulf. The tragedy of Yugure and Kionomi should have been example enough that we could not count on the enemy for such stupidity. On the 1st of August, we steamed out of Rabaul in a column led by Amagiri. As lead ship and scout for the force, she carried no cargo. The following three destroyers, Hagikaze, Arashi, Shigure, were loaded with a total of 900 troops and 120 tons of supplies. I was apprehensive on my first real sortie of the year. In my absence from action, the seas of the Central Solomons had claimed many illustrious destroyers. Kagero, Kuroshio and Oyashio veterans of Tanaka's victorious battle off Savo Island were sunk by mines and air attack on May 8, 1943. My Java Sea battle teammate Nagatsuki and Nizuki were lost in these waters in July. Hatsuyuki, hero of the October 1942 Savo Island battle, was blasted into the ocean depths near Bougainville on July 17. I became lost in these contemplations on Shigure's bridge, watching the darkening ocean, and wondered how many and which of the four ships on this sortie would survive. As night came, I was relieved to see that it was pitch dark, and hoped that luck would be with us. We entered Blackett Strait, which threads between Kolombangara and three smaller islands to the southwest. Both sides of this hazardous, narrow waterway are lined for miles with dangerous reefs and shoals. Engines were stopped at the rendezvous point, and our three loaded ships drifted in silence. Dozens of barges came swiftly out from shore to receive our cargo. Working very efficiently, they cleared our ships of all troops and supplies within twenty minutes, it was a great relief to see Hagikaze's hooded lamp signal, let's go home. Amagiri went ahead to lead the way while the other three of us warmed engines, and within five minutes we were headed back through the weird and treacherous waterway. I had alerted Shigure's bridge and lookouts for any sign of danger. The enemy with his tight scout networks in this area must have detected our activities and might spring out from any of the myriad shoals that lined the maze-like strait. Ten minutes after getting underway from the rendezvous, we were making thirty knots through the confined waters. This was a truly breakneck speed for such a dangerous waterway. In peacetime, no ship would have ventured here at night in excess of twelve knots, even with all lights burning. We, of course, were running fully blacked out. The night was sultry, but cold sweat stood out on every brow. We passed Arundel and Wanawana and caught up with Amagiri as we drew a beam of Gizo. We then drew into a tight column formation with only 500 metres between ships. My eyes, well adjusted to the darkness, suddenly caught the movement of a small black object moving swiftly from the left toward Amagiri, which was some 1,500 metres ahead of Shigure. I could not determine what the object was, but groaned, here it comes, and braced for a fearsome explosion at any moment. The black object melted into the darkness and was gone, with no explosion, no flash, no fire. It was mystifying. The suggestion of bustling activity on board Amagiri was borne out when her veiled lamp flashed a swift message. Enemy torpedo boats encountered. One rammed and sunk. Hagikaze and Arashi machine guns suddenly barked and I saw them fire a torrent of bullets to starboard. Two violently burning torpedo boats came into view near the two destroyers. I gave the order for Shigure's guns to open fire and the crews, who had been standing by with fingers on triggers, responded beautifully. The flaming craft disappeared into the black water, as if they had never existed. These two burning torpedo boats must have been the two halves of PT-109. Cheers of joy and laughter sounded and echoed in each of our destroyers as we continued running at top speed. I understood the elation at our good fortune, but could not join the merrymaking. My spine was still creeping at the thought of the close shave we had had, as I recalled the loss of Terutsuki in December 1942 to motor torpedo boats. This new Japanese destroyer of 3,470 tons was sunk as the result of two hits by torpedoes delivered by a couple of 50-ton torpedo boats. The same fate could have just as well befallen us this night if the enemy had spotted us and reacted a few minutes earlier. Outside of Vela Gulf, we slackened speed and returned uneventfully to Rabul. Our crews were still exultant about the victory, but I was apprehensive and glum. Reason for the glumness appeared when I reported to headquarters and received an official report that awaited me. 
Destroyers Mikazuki, Destroyer Division 30, and Ariake Destroyer Division 27, while on a transport mission to Tuluvu, New Britain, grounded near Cape Gloucester on July 27th, and were attacked next day by B-25, which demolished them completely. Only seven crewmen were killed. I returned sadly to Shigure, once again commander of a one-ship division. How swift the tempo of attrition! Of the glorious Quintet of July, only two ships remained a month later. How could both Mikazuki and Ariake have been so clumsy and inept as to run aground? Depressed and dispirited, I downed several bottles of sake that night. Yamagami joined me in drowning sorrow for an hour or so, and then retired. I stayed up and drank myself into a stupor. Two days later, on the morning of August 4th, Captain Kaju Sugiura, commander of Destroyer Division 4, invited Yamagami and me to his flagship to attend a conference. The day was sunny and we had a pleasant boat ride over to Destroyer Hagikaze. The conference table and chairs set up on the foredeck were shaded by a small awning. We were the last to arrive, and the skippers and execs of the other destroyers gave us a cordial greeting. Sujura, several years my senior and a staff college graduate, opened the conference with a general greeting and then stated the business of the day. Gentlemen, I am very happy to report that our last transport mission to Kolombangara was a complete success, thanks to your splendid cooperation.